so we'll just be form or informal. So um, seven quick questions. You can elaborate as much as you want, but again, it's just this idea that for them, it's giving them a perspective into the current system. We've talked like a lot about the past. We're kind of delving a little bit into the future, but really getting into the present. So, yeah. um, so first question, what are some of the complexities of the educational system in terms of governance? So for example, like how the state and the district and even at the school level, you both have different perspectives there. Um, curriculum and instruction, assessment, and providing equitable education to all students. And that's a big question, so yeah. I can chunk that down as we go. Uh, it's a good question for a principal. <laughs> oh, man. Um, <laughs> there are many complexities. So I think that for us who were working in the field at the school sites, we're with our students every day. You know, we have best intentions, and you know, we feel like we can address the needs of our students the best. But there are many layers to our jobs. Um, and many, and by that I mean laws and regulations and expectations that are, again, I'm using the word layered, starting from you know our federal government, our state governments, mm -hmm. our county offices, our district offices. So, you know, so I'm going to use assessments as an example. So state assessments, you know, sometimes we feel like we're over assessing our students, and so, but unfortunately, some of those are out of our control. So yeah. we try to, you know, we try to do what we can. Um, in terms of controlling what we can in our school sites and our districts. But one of the things that, that we find is, and I, I feel this way in our current state, where we, our state meaning our situation as a, as a school, is you're trying to reduce the amount of these formal assessments. You know, assessments are good. I'm a firm believer in assessments, but these, these kind of standardized assessments, one of the places we're at right now is we're, we don't want to be teaching to the test but unfortunately, so much rides on that with the regulations and you know the accountability systems that states have that we are we find ourselves kind of going back to where we were. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. where we're assessing more and more to prepare for the big assessment. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get caught in the cycle of assessing, assessing, assessing. And again, firm believer in assessments, but these standardized assessments is what sometimes can be overwhelming for our students. Yeah, no, that's good because we talked about that yesterday. I, yeah. I shared the Obama little clip yes. I think for like years ago where he's yeah. like. Let's like back off on testing, and then he left office, and that right. just was an ideal that floated there. That's for a while. it. That's exactly where we're at. <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> Jared, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, kind of to piggyback off your comment about Obama is from a teacher's standpoint, uh, as a high school teacher in the classroom, I feel like the changes come so quickly mm -hmm. as far as assessment and curriculum, and we're always kind of chasing the next big idea, and then before you can even see if the next big idea is bearing any yeah. type of fruit be ready to move on to the next idea. So just like what you mentioned about, there's a, a politician in office and then they make a policy decision before you can even see if it had any positive or negative effect, we're already moving on to a new politician with a new idea. So just yeah. for instance, you know, in the time that I've been at my high school, we've, we've changed curriculum essentially every year in, in some major ways and in some minor ways. And to me, with my style of teaching, I always wanna teach something once just as a trial run to see what worked and what didn't and how I want to like make changes in the future. And then maybe by the third or fourth year, I really have it down to where I feel confident about it as far as assessments or curriculum. And when we're constantly making changes, I don't feel like I'm always given the time to see things through um, as far as I'd like to. So I feel like that's, um, that's one thing. And then I, I see equitable education uh, on your question. And when I hear equitable education from a classroom teacher standpoint, what I think of is the fact that <clears throat> to some degree my class and the other teachers teaching my subject at the high school we kind of need to be equitable and so the positive thing about that is that you don't want students to complain that if you get so-and-so's class it's super easy and there's no work and if you get so-and-so's class then you get to read these books and if you take this teacher then you read those books especially because i teach english there's choices to be made so with an equitable system where we're working within a plc it's nice that students, more or less, they get the same curriculum no matter whose class they're in, but then obviously you get into education and teaching because you're excited about certain things. Yeah. And when you're working within a PLC, you're, you have limitations. And so, you know, I was really excited to sign on and teach senior English. And they're like, well, these are the things you're teaching. And then I'm like, well, is there any flexibility in that? And they're yeah. kind of like, no. And they're kind of like, you can teach it the way you want to teach it, yeah. but these are the assessments. And sometimes they're state assessments. And sometimes the district doesn't even have a lot of input on the assessments. And sometimes they're more like PLC self-generated assessments. But either way, it's like, you know, I feel like this idea of equitable education is a two-edged sword where I think teachers want to have freedom, 
but then we do need to make sure that students are having similar experiences within many different classrooms. Yeah. So I'd say that that's a complexity within the system that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Cool. Yeah. Then um, let me add to that too, just with equity for both of you. We talked a lot yesterday just about, you know, we went through the history of ed and you both taught 3900, so you know what it's like. Um, and I really did a little bit differently where we, we took those, you know, the four corner chart right. or whatever, but I had them go by era, had them get up and really just kind of watch right. Right, over time how things progress. And I said, what was the theme you saw? And a lot of them kept saying, it just seems like there's a theme of access here, you know, starting with just boys being educated, then maybe girls, oh yeah, not students of color, right. and then kind of students of color. So like all of these things. Right. I think when I talk about equity, where do you see that evolving more or maybe still plateauing in terms of how we're providing equitable access for our students? I have a good answer to that. Yeah, um, I think our school just recently went one-to-one, -one, and oh, okay. then that means that every student has a device that's issued by the district. And so as far as the digital divide is concerned, where you had the technological haves and have-nots, which I think is one yeah. of, obviously race and gender are still issues. Don't 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 think that I'm trying to, to be dismissive of those topics. Sure. But when it comes to students in education, I think one of the big indicators of success and non-success was access to technology. And I think that the district, by adopting the one-to-one -one model, has really given students access to the technology, to the internet, um, to the things that they need, and they can take them home and they can work on them when they have the time. And so it's really solved a lot of problems. I was worried about the one-to-one -one model. We were resistant in the district. We really didn't want it because we we're worried about computers getting broken and stolen and et cetera. And I've had zero issues. Like I've had no issues with computers. They've been nothing but a benefit to my class. And I can't, I'm just excited that every single kid has access to Google Forms, Google Docs, like they, they can do projects, they can write papers. It's just, it's amazing. So, that's awesome. yeah, so that's been one giant leap that I've seen just in the, you know, few years that I've been educating from a classroom teacher standpoint. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. And just kind of thinking kind of more federally, globally, <clears throat> just thinking about going back to a point we were making earlier, uh, that uh, Mr. Jeffries made earlier about the, the impact that our leadership has, right? And you think about, you know, we are often, a, we, we like to be kind of on the forefront and doing things kind of leading the, the way when it comes to providing equity um, in our schools. You know, sometimes we're beholden to what our legislators um, put forward for us, what our president puts forward for us, what our district leaders put forward for us in terms of what what those equitable opportunities are for our students. Um, so yeah, and I think about, I don't see how though, kind of in a more kind of broad view, I don't see, kind of to your question, I don't see how we can go back Right, I don't see how, I feel like we're constantly moving forward. Yeah. And just, just in our short time in education, I feel like we've done so much work with equity. Great example with the technology, thinking about being more aware, aware of this idea of the gender spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. And being more cognizant of that, being more supportive and understanding of that. And I think of myself as a student and how that would not have even been a question or a topic of consideration <laughs> for students who were, you know, who were questioning the, you know, their sexuality. Now we've moved to a point where we're understanding of that we're, we're being aware of that in the way we speak to students our understanding of just restrooms making those available and, and anyway so all of that and so I feel like we're moving forward especially in our state I feel like we, we do a good job of that yeah. um, so I hope and I pray that we continue to do that and be more aware of that and only getting better right and making yeah. so that any barriers that really shouldn't be there for our students are gone so we can do the important work of educating our students cool so that's a good segue I think because we talked about the other kind of equitable issue or at least access issue is finances. Yeah. And so I think obviously as a principal, you can speak to have real finances and then even yeah. as a teacher, like how much does finances play a role? So the question I think I posed was how does school finance work and impact your work as an educator and as an administrator? Greatly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, st starting from staffing our full, you know, FTE allotment, you know, full-time employees, looking at the number of teachers at each site, I know that a lot of that is contingent upon um, the funding that we get, mm -hmm. right? So and I remember working at the high school and our entire master schedule of 2,000 plus students was contingent upon the number of FTs that we were allotted for the year, the, the number of teachers that we get to have. So then it's a big puzzle of how do I continue to support the programs at our site with the number of staff that I have. And you know, once in a while it was great because you your FT actually went up, so you can add a program or expand a program particularly those programs like your CTEs, those, those pathways. Yeah. But, um, you know, if it went down, it's a year that the budget, you know, nationally was not looking good. 
So you might take a hit. So then you have to figure out, hopefully through attrition, that you can um, not have to lay off anyone. But there is a real possibility that we're, you know, we, we're not going to be able to staff a particular pathway, a CT pathway, for example, or our PE classes are going to look a little bit larger this year because we're not able to replace a teacher. Um, but then to everyday, like your everyday supplies and classroom materials, all of that is contingent on budget. So, um, I mean, the, the basic answer is it has a huge impact on everything that we do. Um, the, the budget does. I just, I don't know, I feel like yeah. you probably feel the same way in the classroom, right? That everything you do has is affected by the amount of money that we get. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because I think as an educator, right, because we weren't to meet, um, a lot of ones, I didn't see that. I always just thought when I heard about budget stuff, I just thought, I could teach my kids without paper right. and, and pencils right. and like, oh, yeah. but there's more to it, right? Absolutely. Um, anything to add, Jared? Yeah, I think there's just, as a classroom teacher, there's probably a lot behind the scenes that I don't see. Yeah. I mean, I does it matter that that fell asleep? I don't mean No, that. it's fine. Okay. Yeah, this um, um, I'm just thankful that, you know, I do read about districts where it's like, you get one ream of paper for the year, yeah, right. you know, or things like that. And so, I mean, it's only speaking from the district in which I work, like, I feel really fortunate because, like, there's always copy paper, um, there, you know, there's my projector works, yeah, um, my right. heater works. Like if I do maintenance uh, requests, they're done in a timely manner and stuff. So it's like, um, and then I feel like we're compensated pretty fairly here in the Valley, at least the district I work at. So from my personal experience of the whole financial picture that I don't fully understand, like I feel like I'm lucky to work in a district where I feel like they're being good stewards of the finances because I feel like the teachers are better taken care of than other stories that I've heard in other districts. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I think that'll, yeah, that'll, well, the third one then. So they're emerging educators. They, it was really cool yesterday. We had this awesome experience, and I think they felt that too, just this idea of this is an ugly system, but why are you going into it? And I think right. they were all positively saying, we see that, but we want to make a difference. Yeah. So what would you coach them on? So how can emerging educators successfully navigate this system, the complexity of this system? Um, I think one thing that comes to mind is taking care of yourself. Right, just a room, and I think I shared this with the class when I was there the other day. Just this idea that um, you can't be there for your students if you're not there for yourself. This idea that there are so many things that are just going to be thrown your way as an emerging educator, and there's so much that you're learning constantly, and it's extremely overwhelming. Um, and so this idea that you got to take care of yourself, you got to find the things that. Um, that help you kind of recharge your batteries and rejuvenate. And so just kind of reminding yourself that it will get better. And I just take care of myself along the way, finding things that are, are that excite me, finding things that help me again, rejuvenate. Um, and just again, reminding yourself why you're there. The, you know, the program isn't easy, right? Mm -hmm. And these classes aren't easy. So you're getting through that. So if you're getting through that, what is it that's helping you get through that? So kind of using that same mindset, that same mentality, whatever it may be that's getting you through, kind of carrying that with you through your first few years as an educator um, to avoid burnout. I, don't know. Yeah. I think uh, surrounding yourself with the positive yeah. and uh, yeah. successful teachers at your site is key because I see a lot of like clicks and where you have like the uh, really bitter people, the fed up people, the people that don't want to spend their time complaining, they tend to hang together. And then the opposite of the people that are positive, they're usually spending their time working with kids, honestly. They're usually not spending their time like in, in the workroom talking or things like that. I mean, not that I'm against you spending your lunch in the, in the, in the lunchroom uh, <clears throat> talking with your colleagues, but I find that the people that are most productive and happy and positive on campus, they're always engaged with students, usually throughout the day. And so you kind of maybe have to seek them out more yeah. because they might be busy and things of that nature. But I was really lucky when I got placed with my mentor teacher a long time ago. He was an older teacher, but he wasn't the stereotypical burnout type of guy that was just waiting to retire. Like he still wanted to innovate and he still wanted to make his classroom <clears throat> as, as great as it could be. And the students respected him and kids learned. And so he was a model for me that there's this kind of narrative that teachers is like you're 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 really passionate for a few years and then you hit a wall and then you're burnt out for the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. And you hear that a lot and it's scary because you're afraid that you're gonna become one of those people. But if you can see someone that can mentor that that doesn't have to be the case, then you can emulate that. And that's kind of what I've tried to do where it's like, if I feel myself, like Samit mentioned, like burning out or whatever, it's like I try to remind myself, like it doesn't have to be that way. Like it's not an inevitable that you're always griping and complaining and focused on the negatives. Like 
you're in control of your own attitude, but you have to surround yourself with the right people in order to keep that mentality on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. That's why we're here. Thanks, guys. <laughs>